Bismillah, Assalamu Alaikum, peace be with you. Welcome to another episode of Let's Talk. I'm your moderator, Omar Dunlap, and we have with us Sheikh Asim Al Haqim. Assalamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Assalam wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. And we have with us our wonderful studio audience. Assalamu Alaikum. Uh, and today on Let's Talk, we're discussing the issue of giving Islam our absolute best, uh, our best efforts, not leaving our leftovers uh, for Islam, what we can just throw something. No, giving it our absolute best, whether uh, in propagating it or uh, in our worship ourselves and our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and, and so on because these days uh, many Muslims we get so wrapped up in, in dunya uh, you know in making sure we have the best house and the, the most expensive car and the best degree and so we felt that it was an, uh, an important topic uh, to to discuss this issue so without going too much into it I'm gonna give the the, the, the mic over here to uh, Sheikh Asim and let us let him give us his uh, reflection Rahim. <laughs> الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على عبده ورسوله الأمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين It goes without saying that as Muslims we have the most honorable task and mission any person could have Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran that there is no one better than who calls for Allah and performs or does righteous deeds and says I am among the Muslims I am a Muslim so it's something to be proud of that you are a Muslim and Allah tells us that it is the best thing and there's no one better than this person now when I reflect on giving Islam our very best and our efforts this gives me the idea that there are people who think that Islam is a separate entity and it's different than our lives and I do beg to differ because Islam is total submission to Allah Azza wa Jal and I always give this example that Islam is like a frame and our lives is like a photograph the proper thing for a Muslim to do if he is a practicing true Muslim is to bring this frame which is Islam and place it over his life and cut the edges so that Islam would fit completely to your life and nothing goes out what the majority of people are doing nowadays they're doing this process but instead of cutting the edges they're trying to widen the angles of the frame a bit and maybe uh, uh, get a scotch tape and tape it here and put a couple of nails here at the end of the day you'll have a distorted Islam and this is the majority of the people what they're embracing is is a distorted Islam I see no difference between our lives and Islam Allah the Almighty tells us that I have not created the heavens and the earth uh, I have not created the jinn and the human beings except to worship me so this is the soul purpose of our creation yet one would argue and say but there are millions and millions of people who are not worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal yes because they're not fulfilling Allah's will and that's why they'll, they're going to be punished for that but as a Muslim I am created I know that I'm created to worship Allah but again one would argue does this mean I have to stay in the masjid for 24 hours and I have to fast all day long and I have to do this and I have to do that no and this is the focal point there is no difference between our lives and Islam as practicing true Muslims and that is why our whole program and schedule of the day should be 
manifesting worshiping Allah. And how is that? Well, simple. If you look at the way that the Prophet lived, والسلام, you would see that portrayed in front of you. All of his tasks, all of the things that he does والسلام, during the day and night are forms of worship. Even talking to someone, even when he plays with his wives, even when he raises Aisha, may Allah be peace with her, the mother of the believers. He raised her twice. Now, if you come to one of us, uh, those who claim to be students of knowledge or scholars, when was the last time you raced with your wife? You crazy? I raced with my wife. Uh, I may wrestle, wrestle with her, but <laughs> race with her? No way. They think that this is degrading. Well, the Prophet did not think of it this way. When someone who is lower than us comes to talk to us, we may look down at them and say, listen, send someone who's older, someone who is richer, someone who is more influencer, uh, uh, with influence than you to come and talk to me. I don't talk like, to, to people like you. While the Prophet ﷺ, a young girl of seven or eight years old, used to come and say, oh Prophet, I have a problem. And she used to take his hand, and the Prophet walks with her, she walks in the streets of Medina, telling him uh, uh, her problems, and he would listen. So this is also another form of worship. This means that we have to utilize our time for the benefit of Islam. And by utilizing your time, this does not mean you have to limit your efforts and work only to da'wah, only to prayers, but you have to widen the spectrum a bit and to include that even your work at the office should be for the sake of Allah. What is it, your intention when you work 9 to 5? To get money. What for? I don't know. I, I need a, a bigger plasma screen in the house. I need a new set of stereo. I need a new car. I'd like to change the rims of my car, my, my, my car or my ride and have it low rims and etc. I need to this, I need that. Well, you have a problem. But those who are practicing would say, I need the money so that I could put food on the table so that my family, my kids would not need to beg. They'd have everything that's sufficient for them. I need money so I personally would have something to pay for sadaqah, for charity. I need money so that I could secure some of the needs of my family and my loved ones and my relatives. I need the job because it gives me a chance to meet others, to call them to Islam. It, so this is one aspect, which is your job. If you go to your recreation, the same thing goes on. Why are you working out in the gym? To become stronger. Why do you want to become stronger? So that anyone who cuts in me while I'm driving, I can easily stop him and beat the hell out of him. <laughs> well, this is un-Islamic. Why do you want to get stronger? I don't know, I want to impress women. Again, this is the no-no, wrong answer. Why do you want to be stronger? So that I can pray night prayer without being tired so quickly. So that I can fight in the cause of Allah whenever there is need to defend my country, whenever there is need to defend my wealth, whenever there is need to defend my honor. If someone wants to attack my family, I have to be there. And it gives me a good shape and people would look at me and say, MashaAllah, Islam doesn't tell you to be weak and vulnerable and, 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 and so on. But at the same time, it tells you not to be uh, uh, someone who is over the edge in, uh, and beating people and so on. So, Islamically, a person should give all of his time, and this depends on the intention, all of his time, all of his effort, all of what he knows to, for the sake of Allah. Why? Because by this, you would be fulfilling Allah's will in worshipping Him. But if you segregate, you say, well, this is what's for Caesar, and this is what's for me. This is, God forbid, Zani. What is for Allah? Allah, Allah wants me to pray five times a day, and the rest, I do everything else in my mind. This would not be giving Islam your very best. Very good.
In reviewing it, I think another question has, has come to my mind that I think maybe we need to, to address. Uh, when we say, as is the topic of this episode, that Muslims should work harder at their religion and being good Muslims and spreading the correct uh, message of, of Islam, are we, also, are we saying that we should also put our doing our best at work and at home and in school on the back burner? Or are we not saying that? <laughs> well, if we looked at the title of this segment, mm -hmm. probably we would. Yeah. But the Prophet ﷺ gave us the answer to this question by saying that Allah, the Almighty, loves when some of you is doing a task that he perfects it. Mm. And this goes all over. So it goes with propagation of Islam, it goes with your performing forms of worship, and it goes with your daily job, with your studying in, in, in university or at school. It is a concept that all Muslims must perfect. That whenever you do something, do it in the best fashion possible. And that is why this one of the brothers who was asked, he justified the early Muslims by saying that they gave all what they had to modernize the sciences and develop and improve what they had at the time. And this is the, 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 the technology that we're enjoying nowadays is the result of their studies and their hard work. Yet, we have to be careful when we generalize and say that these scientists were Muslims mm. because some of them had corrupt ideology and they had only Islam by the name. Nevertheless, we have proper practicing Muslims who were scientists, who um, added a lot to uh, science and, and technology without compromising their own religion. Mm. And this is the balance that we have to have. It is almost impossible to say that, what are you doing? You're doing more to Islam, or you're doing more to science, or your, your school, or your family, or... As I said in the very beginning, it is... You're putting everything in a blender. And at the end of the day, you are doing what Allah Azza wa wants you to do. Because you're practicing, uh, uh, you're a practicing Muslim, and your Islam tells you to perfect everything that you do. So... To be clear, you would say that the message is nothing should be done half-heartedly, right? We, if we're going to do it, whether it's school or being Muslim, we should do both of them 100% to the best of our ability. This is what Allah says in the Qur'an. Allah says in the Qur'an, prepare whatever you can of force to fight the enemies. Mm. Whatever you can. So in order to prepare this, you need to have rocket science uh, scientists, you have to have people who know technology, who know engineering, who know medicine, who know uh, nan nano sciences and technologies, and, and everything, in all aspects. But this would not uh, uh, interfere with your worship of Allah, because this is part of your worship of Allah. But if someone comes and says, listen, I have to work in the lab, I can't pray a couple of prayers, so I'm going to skip it, mm -hmm. because I'm working for Allah. No, this goes beyond the red lines that we're not supposed to. Well, what if someone isn't going that far? Let's say he's not missing his salah, but he gets so wrapped up in his work that maybe he isn't spending as much time with his family as he should. Or maybe he's not missing his salah, but he delays it to the last minute and he's not really focusing because he's thinking about what's going on in his school or his lab or something, something like that. Would you say that that's like a warning sign that he needs to sort of reprioritize? Definitely. He has a problem with priorities mm -hmm. because there are no-nos. There are red lines that you should not cross at all. And among these things are your prayers. Mm -hmm. You cannot... Uh, delay them or not pray them with congregation because these are your priorities now the family you have to have someone to take care of them if there's no one except you and you're focusing on something else then you have a problem because you are choosing something that is not the appropriate thing and, and I give you an example in forms of worship a lot of people may understand this if you are in the last 10 nights of Ramadan and let's assume you are on the 27th of Ramadan and the Imam is praying taraweeh prayer or night prayer, which is the most 
preferred prayers to Allah at that time. And you, instead of praying with them, say to yourself, no, I'm going to make tawaf around the Kaaba and make umrah. And uh, this is rewardable by Allah. It is rewardable by Allah. But at this particular moment, the best thing you can do is to pray with the congregation and supplicate to Allah. And you can delay this later on. So you have to prioritize in order to reach what Allah wants from you. Very good. Okay, I think at this point we're going to go to our audience and see if they have any questions. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Go ahead. Yes, I would like to ask that if you see a friend, for instance, at a university doing something wrong, for instance, talking to a girl, should you pull him to the side and say this is wrong, or should you uh, leave it for later? Or, or ask him for a double you date? Tell him at all? <laughs> <laughs> well, definitely it is not to pull him and put yourself in a situation that is, is not something to be praised for. What you should do is, whenever you see something that is wrong, you have to tell people, educate people, and you have to change this vice, as the Prophet said, وسلم, whenever you see vice, munkar, you should change it with your hand if you have authority, with your tongue if you don't have authority but you can advise, and with your heart if you are hope, uh, helpless and the only thing you can do is just, you know, uh, try to change it with your heart by, by moving out, by leaving the place. So, if you see someone like this, you should advise him, but you should pick the right moment. If you advise him in front of his girlfriend, he's going to feel insulted and he would like to, pre to prove his manhood in front of her. So, probably he would say bad things to you and maybe curse Islam and maybe commit something that would make him an apostate. God forbid. So you should keep this in mind. Once you see him, you can write him an email, you can send him a letter, you can talk to him in the evening, and w it, not straightforward, you know, just give it like five, six minutes, and then go into the subject. But this is the proper Muslim, who is not impersonating something he is not, but he who is actually believing in changing the whole world to what pleases Allah within his capacity. So whenever I see something that is not in accordance to what Allah wants, I try my best, and my best has limitations. I try my best to change this, but I would not allow Satan to execute my heart. I would not allow myself to have a dead heart whenever I see bad things happening. I just look at them, give it a smile, and move away. I have to have this in myself to be able to give all of me for the sake of Islam and give Islam my best efforts. I have to comment on something you said because it's so perfect to something I witnessed with my own eyes. You're saying, don't correct him in front of his girlfriend, he'll feel like he needs to say something and maybe he'll say something against Islam just in anger. I saw this exact thing happen where I was with a, a Muslim friend of mine who's very outspoken, but he's good Muslim, alhamdulillah. And we were walking in the street and he saw a guy and a girl way closer than they should have been, and it was very obvious, you know, they weren't married or anything. And he just, my friend just told him, fear Allah, you know, he said it very tough like that. And they got in this argument which ended with the, the guy with the girlfriend, the brother with the girlfriend, he said, okay, fine, I'm a kafir. La ilaha illa and he's not, you know, but yeah. he was angry. So th I just think it's amazing that you told this and I've seen this happen with my own eyes. Believe me, it is the best way of calling people to Islam by just smiling at them. So many times those who do wrong know that they're doing wrong, but they don't need you to come and tell them because they wish that you're doing the same thing that they're doing. In so many cases, I drive by people, by young, young guys, with their windows down in their cars and they're putting M&M or uh, uh, 50 cents or 25 cents or whatever <laughs> and they're blowing their speakers out. Mm. I, be, I, I bet you they don't, betting is haram. I challenge <laughs> you that they know nothing of what these guys are saying. But they're just, you know, cruising and doing this and being who I am, I just simply drive next to them and say, Assalamu alaikum with a very big smile. <laughs> the first thing they do, is they turn it off. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. And I say, may Allah forgive us all on the day of judgment and make us with the Prophet.
And they say, Jazakallah khair, may Allah do that for us. Thank you, Shaykh. I didn't do anything. I just gave a smile and a salam. And it had its effect. If everyone does this, pe people will change. Unfortunately, we're very passive. We're very negative. We don't want to contribute. And Satan comes and intimidates us with so many things. And at the end of the day, we end up putting ourselves in a shell and isolating ourselves from the others and claiming to be Allah's chosen people. Mm. I know we've gotten a little off topic. We, now we're talking about how to correct people. So maybe if you have a question more towards uh, giving Islam our best effort. Go ahead. Okay. Bismillah. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm an English instructor. Uh, so I try to use my English as much as I can to reveal the best image or the most favorite image of Islam. Uh, this is not because I'm an instructor. This is um, the place where I send an invitation to everybody, doctors, engineers, students, even the guys who spend their time surfing the internet uh, on unuseless things or useless things or unnecessary things. Why don't you try to use the internet to uh, create websites uh, to um, give the best image of Islam because you know we are image of the Islam. So if foreigners or tourists here in Egypt or whatever or whatever so was doing something wrong as uh, myself I had an experience a personal experience I was riding a car with my friend he uh, is from the United States of America we were drinking soft drinks when I finished mine, I threw it out of the window of the car. He stopped the car and said, Amen, get it again. And I get it and put it in a recycle bin. I was so embarrassed. But uh, from this, this happened two years ago. Since then, I haven't done something like that and tried to tell my friends not to do something like that because we are images for Islam. Uh, how can we say that Allah says cleanliness is next to godliness and at the same time you don't do something like that? That's all. Thank you very much. Okay. As for the hadith, it's not a hadith. So cleanliness is, is next to good, uh, godliness. A proverb. It's a proverb. Um, it, it is true. We have to do what we preach. Hmm. It's, it's not enough only to preach. And the best form of making da'wah is to actually be a practicing Muslim. Now, there are people who go the extra mile. Now, most of Muslims know what is halal and what is haram. But they find it difficult to go the extra mile in propagating because they are not themselves performing. So you cannot propagate something that you're not doing. So I believe that it is true that we have to give the role model to the people. But before we do that, we ourselves have to be practicing what we preach and this American friend of yours he told you to go and pick it up because this is what he believes and regardless whether he's Muslim or not but okay he's not a Muslim this is what he believes now if you look at the other religions you feel that they have more commitment to their religions than we do and, and this is unfortunate because of their conviction and because of our weak belief in our believes Though we have the ultimate truth is Islam. N no Muslim would doubt this. But yet we fail to go and call people to Islam because we are ourselves lazy. We're not putting enough effort to this. Mm, very good. What role do parents play in helping the children correctly prioritize, you know, between, you know, life and Islam and, and all this sort of thing? And the bonus question... <laughs> Are we doing our job as parents, those of us who are parents? Well, I'll, I'll answer the bonus question. <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> Unfortunately, if we were doing our jobs as we're supposed to be, we would not be in the situation we're in. Mm. We have a cultural gap. And the kids uh, grow seeing their parents doing something and learning it at school and learning at the masjid that they should be doing something else. In Islam, there is no separation. Mm -hmm. Islam, work, entertainment, they all are put in a melting pot and you get one 
substance that is one, not so many. If you go back to the Sunnah, you would find that the family used to make the children grow up thinking that Islam is their life and to serve only Islam. For example, Umm Sulaim, may Allah be pleased with her, she's the mother of Anas. Anas was 10 years old when she brought him to the Prophet when he first came to Medina and she said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, Anas is a learned child. Let him be with you, serve you and learn from you. Mm. The Prophet didn't need that, mm -hmm. but he would not return this woman with a broken heart, so he accepted the boy. The boy lived with the Prophet and his family for 10 years, stating that I've never seen the Prophet reprimand me for something that I did by saying, why did you do this? Or for something I did not do, shouldn't you have done so and so? He would not say this to him. In one incident, Umm Sulaim saw her child Anas walking the streets of Medina. The Prophet entrusted him with a secret. Mm -hmm. And he told him, do this thing, don't tell anyone about it. So, he met his mother on the road. And she said, where are you going? He said, um, the Prophet asked me to do something. She said, what did he ask you to do? Now, the boy is 10 years old. The first thing any 10 years old would do is to say the secret. <laughs> and the first thing that comes into mind, if he doesn't, the mother's going to spank him. Hmm. So Anna said, I can't tell you, it's a secret. <laughs> what did the mother do? The mother showed him the role model. She said, don't ever say the secret of the Prophet ﷺ to any soul. Hmm. She didn't go on the offensive. She, she approved what he did. Now this shows you that it goes side by side. He is there to serve the Prophet والسلام, and this is world. Mm. This is worldly things. But he's not there simply for the worldly things. He's there to learn religion. And by not separating, this is the result that we get. Anas ibn Malik, one of the great scholars of Islam. Likewise, this cascades all over. When I go to do some shopping and my child comes and says, Oh, father, let me come with you. And I say, well, I'm going to take an injection at the hospital. <laughs> and the, the child says, oops, okay, <laughs> go, may Allah be with you. <laughs> I'm not giving the role model, mm. which means that whenever I'm going to talk about Islam, he's not going to pay any attention because I'm not practicing what I preach. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting uh, what you said because uh, I know a sister that worked in an Islamic school and she saw frequently how the parents were interacting with the children and uh, she told me one day she said that it's so bizarre she's an American she said uh, you know convert to Islam she said it's it's so amazing to me that they will tell their children who's asking for some more like sweets there aren't any more sweets like lie to them rather than tell them no you can't have it and I'm the parent and you don't need any more and the child knows that the parent is lying because just saw the sweets on the counter, you know. But they, you know, the parent isn't thinking about what sort of psychological aspect this will, this will have on the child. So, I mean, is this a common phenomenon? Or it, it is, unfortunately. Yeah. Every one of us know, unfortunately, in the houses that we do not consider them to be practicing Muslims. That if someone calls by phone and the child answers, and he says, "Okay, one minute, father, it's so and so." And the father says, tell him I'm not here. <laughs> and so, so my father says, you're not here. <laughs> <laughs> this is common mm. because people are not practicing. It's not the culture. Mm. It's the absence of religion. Mm. And likewise, those who do not lie, for example, and this is, this is one of the, the, the beautiful attributes in the West. Though they're Christians, though they're disbelievers to us, but they do not lie. Mm. And why is that? Is it because of their religion? No. This is how they're brought up. Mm. They would do anything. They would sin, they would <laughs> drink, <they're> intoxicated, <laughs> fornicate. 
but they don't lie. They would say the truth. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. us Muslims, we're compelled by religion not to say a lie. The Prophet ﷺ saw a woman once telling her child, come, come, mm-hmm. take this. Because, you know, when we want to grab our children, we just pretend that we want to give them something, now I got you. Mm-hmm. Well, the Prophet saw her and said, what do you want to give him? She opened her hand and said, a date, O Prophet of Allah. And there was a date. Mm. She said, by Allah, if there wasn't anything in your hand, it would have been recorded as a lie mm. at Allah's side. Now imagine how many lies do we say, not to our children, mm. to our bosses, to our subordinates, to our neighbors, at work, to the police. Mm. And it, it, it becomes like a habit, people lying to their wives. Mm. Mm. This shows you the split is there and no one thinks of Islam as a priority. It's always at the back seat, if not in the trunk. Like two minutes and I wanted to bring this specific topic up. What about what we call in America, I don't know if they have it in the Muslim world, but I think they do. We call them Ramadan Muslims, you know. In Ramadan, we go to the masjid and pray and we see these faces we've not seen (laughs) our whole life. Where did they come from? You know, suddenly uh, for the days of Eid, for example, the masjid is pouring out into the streets. These people that you've never seen them, seen them before. Uh, and I mean, we're talking about giving Islam our absolute best. What do you have to say about them, about that situation? Unfortunately, we do have a lot of those seasonal mm. worshippers, and we have to be a little bit careful because we don't want them to abandon <laughs> worshipping Allah for good. They said, okay, you don't want me to see me in Ramadan? I'm not going to come in Ramadan as well. <laughs> no, right. we, would li- we have to draw the line here. Now, uh, most of the Muslims are worshipping Allah by tradition, mm. not by belief. That's why lots of the reverts are stronger in belief and commitment to Islam than the actual born Muslims, mm. unfortunately. For example, Um, There are lots of Muslims who are women who are wearing the hijab, covering up from head to toe, but they're not doing it for the sake of Allah. And the evidence behind this, or that backs this up, is that the minute they uh, 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 get uh, on a plane, traveling to the West, to to England, to Europe, after five or ten minutes of takeoff, they go to the restrooms and they come back, you know, what is this? Yeah old trousers and blouses and makeup mm-hmm. and you, you know for sure that these are not practicing Muslims mm. and they are closer to be sinful if not hypocrites mm. in Islam it's not this way at all you'd find a Muslim in Mecca the same attitude as the brother said the same behavior the same uh, commitment to Islam if he's in Siberia or in Alaska or in in the US. Mm. It's the same thing. He would not, for example, compromise. We have a problem in compromising a lot of our beliefs because we we do not have commitment or we're not simply true believers. We're just, it's it's our fathers and and forefathers uh, practice. Mm. So I think you've managed to get to the heart of the problem then when we're looking at Muslims not putting the best foot forward for Islam, it's because of this issue of compromise and maybe we're just following a tradition and we're not really thinking about what we believe. Does that seem to be the, the consensus? Most yeah. probably, yes. Okay, very good. We'll our studio audience now and see if they have any questions for our two guests. Go ahead, brother. Uh, I'd like to ask the, say, is the Sheikh uh, a question. You, at the very beginning, uh, said that every one of us in the society have a rule to give Islam his best. Uh, And you said also, uh, you should do this rule perfectly. The question is, uh, is how can we do this rule perfectly? Did I say that? You said it. Okay. (laughs) Okay. Well, you have to perfect whatever you do. And regardless of what you're doing, if you're a janitor, you have to clean the floor pretty well. And don't look down at janitors because it's an honest job. If you're a CEO of a company, you have to make sure that everything goes as scheduled and as clockwork. Perfect. Now, for us as Muslims, we as well have to perfect our tasks, whether it is forms of worship 
So when you pray, you don't pray in a couple of minutes. Instead, you, you give the prayer its due. You have to pray on time. You don't pray at home. You pray in the masjid. When you pray, you don't wear the worst clothes you have. You put perfume. So you have to perfect your prayer. When you make da'wah, you have to propagate Islam in the best fashion. Because, as Brother Omar said, to that man who looked at the man and the woman and said, Fear Allah. Now, he gave the good advice. But was it the perfect advice? It wasn't. Because it caused the man to backfire and commit a major sin, if not nullifying his Islam. So, by saying that you have to perfect whatever you do, meaning you have to put your heart into it. Islam, if you give it some of you, it will give you nothing. If you give it all of you, it will give you something. Islam is, in, is not in need of us. You have to be very careful now. Islam doesn't need us. It's the religion of Allah. When all, whenever you look around you and you see that calamities befall uh, uh, upon our brothers in the Muslim world. They are oppressed, they are being executed, killed, their lands is being confiscated and taken uh, uh, unjustly from them. You think that, why is this happening? Well, it's not because we have to work for the sake of the people. We have to work for our sake. So, Islam doesn't need us. Allah will have this religion prevailing overall. And this is mentioned in black and white in the Quran. You have to firmly believe this. But now, where is my role? Would I be part of this change? Part of this effort? Or would I be with the spectator just watching? Mm, nice show. No, Islam wants you to be part of it. You, Islam wants you to make the difference and to give everything within your capability to support this cause. Very good. Do we have another question? Of course we do. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, every one of us uh, wants to give Islam his best. But the Prophet uh, Muhammad وسلم, said that our hearts got, uh, our hearts got uh, rusty just uh, like uh, steel and iron. How can uh, we get rid of these rusty hearts and refresh our faith? Well, if you continue the hadith, the Prophet gave us the remedy. He said that the, 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 the hearts rust then you have to remember Allah. So the Prophet is giving us the answer. So if you want to remove this trust, and if you'd like to revive your heart, you have to remember Allah Azza wa And remembering Allah is not simply saying, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allah Akbar, by the tongue, while your heart is singing a song. <laughs> it, it has to go, you know, a, a heart and soul with this. And this includes all types of, of dhikr. Would that include, for example, salah? And reciting the Quran, Quran and saying good deeds, giving advice. And what we're doing now, mm. this is also dhikr. Mm. Because we're remembering Allah and it's all for the sake of Allah Azza wa So it's, it's, a, it's a wide uh, perspective. Very good. Go ahead. Uh, Sheikh, uh, I wanted to know uh, the qualities of uh, the ideal cooler to Islam. Of the ideal? Cooler or da'ya to Islam. Caller to Islam. Wow. <laughs> Not me, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well... See, again, people differ. If you are a caller to Islam, does this mean that you have to have a, a, a bachelor deg degree? Does it, have, does it mean you have to have a certain certificate in training? Does it mean you have to look in a certain way or dress in a certain way? No. A perfect caller to Islam is, one, a person who's practicing. I could have the best orator coming and talking eloquent words about Islam and the Muslims, but he's not practicing. He's not doing what he's preaching. So, would he be a great caller? No. He would be a great radio station probably, but not a great caller to Islam. A, a, a person who calls others to Islam, he has to be practicing. He has to be knowledgeable. And he has to be sincere. So, whatever he does, he doesn't do it for the money. He doesn't do it for the fame. He doesn't do it so that people would shake hands with and say, MashaAllah, you, you did a, a very good lecture or I like your speech or programs. A great caller to Islam is the one who's sincere, knowledgeable, and at the same time he looks at himself 
as a humble and humiliated servant of Allah. Sheikh, if I say that he should be knowledgeable. Okay, then uh, any person, um, many, many persons are not knowledgeable. Then uh, he can uh, see that I'm not a knowledgeable person. So, uh, show, uh, so uh, I have uh, I haven't to to uh, call to Islam. Uh, there are many uh, knowledgeable persons who can uh, do my or perform my role. Do you role. recite? Do you recite an ayah of the Quran? Do you know by heart one ayah of the Quran? Yes. Or more? More. <laughs> more. The Prophet said, "Alayhi wasallam, balighu anni walu ayah." Convey on my behalf even one ayah. So by conveying one ayah, you're a caller to Islam. Brother, you don't have to be uh, uh, one of the great, 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 great scholars of Islam to be a da'i, to be a caller to Islam. If you teach the children how to recite Fatiha, chapter number one, you're a caller to Islam. If you teach your old grandmother how to say the adhkar after the salah, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, 33 times, La ilaha illallah wa la sharika la mulku alhamdu al kulshi qadir to finish the 100 you are a caller to Islam if you invite your brothers or your friends at school to go and pray with you in the masjid you are a caller to Islam if you give someone a leaflet or a booklet or a cassette all of these things are considered to be callers to Islam you don't have to make a lecture or to uh, interpret uh, verses of the Quran or to give a commentary over uh, uh, hundreds of hadith to be a caller to Islam. So it is a must upon each one of us to call to Islam. It Definitely. Is it is a must to call to Islam all within our capability and reach. Whatever mm. your field is. Yes. Mm. Very Thanks. good. Well, that's all the time we have for today's episode. I would like to thank our Sheikh uh, Awesome for being with us today. And I would like to thank you, Brother Kareem, as well. And of course, thank our studio audience. Uh, but like I said, that's all the time we've got for today's show. So we hope to see you next time, inshallah ta'ala. Until then, I'm Omar Dunlap wishing you peace. Assalamu alaikum.